out of uh, Jefferson City, there was a radio station, and they started playing their Christmas music on November 10th. They got so many complaints, they didn't start it until Thanksgiving this year. People complain all the time. And I remember in our early service for our praise team, I remember several years ago, we started singing Christmas songs the week after Thanksgiving. And the people in the praise team started complaining. No, too much Christmas, too soon. Now, I want you to think for just a second. You see, there are people today, maybe some of you, who set their Christmas tree up on Christmas Eve and take it down on Christmas Day. I know there's some in our church because they've talked to me about it. They don't set it up till 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve and they take it down by noon on Christmas Day. And I want you to just envision for a second how dumb that is. <laughs> because that's equivalent. That's equivalent to remembering our fallen soldiers only on May 30th. That's equivalent to only celebrating our great country on July 4th. That's equivalent to only saying thank you to our many military personnel only on November 11th. That's equivalent to going to church just on Christmas and Easter. Right? It's equivalent to putting everything down into one day, packing everything into one day, only giving thanks on Thanksgiving. How many people do that? Do you know how difficult it is? I bet if I went with a lot of your homes as well, <coughs> on Thanksgiving Day, I'll bet there wasn't one word of thanks. Because that's the way people are. So many people aren't thankful. They go, oh, we're so thankful. And yes, what they're thankful for, I'm thankful for my friends and my family. <coughs> they're not thankful that the Lord sent them to do a job. They're not thankful that God gave them opportunity after opportunity. That even though we might be sick at times, that God rose us up and allowed us to live another day, to perform another personal task that God has given us to change this earth that we live on. Do you think about it? If you hadn't gotten up this morning, you wouldn't have seen this young, lovely young lady be baptized today. You'd have been home just sitting there going, oh man, I wonder what God's going to do with me today. But now, now, you know that you can be praying for Ella. <coughs> because what's Satan going to do? He's going to try and come after her. He's going to try and tell her that what she did was worthless. All she did was get wet. That's what Satan's going to try and tell her. But you need to be praying for her that you're going to keep him back. Remember, the scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now today I'm going to be talking, we're going to be reading Luke chapter 2. So you have to open your Bibles or get out, get out your cell phones, turn to Luke chapter 2. We're going to be reading Luke chapter 2. Now, but I want you to understand something. Today's message is not about the Christmas story. Today's message is about you. It's about you. And that, when I say you, I'm including me with that. It's about us. You see, the church... The church is not a building. The church is the people. The church is you and me. No matter where we're at, we're very important to the Lord. Follow along with me if you would. Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read a lot of verses here, and I'm going to read them quickly. And there are so many areas I'd like to expose to you, but we're not going to. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And you say, wait a second, Pastor Don, we're going to hear this on Christmas Eve, because we usually do it on Christmas Eve. We're going to probably hear it on the 23rd. I'm going to turn into uh, one of the radio stations and somebody's going to read this story. Don't look at the story today so intently unless you put you in that. Unless you're part of it. Follow along. And the census first took place while Tyrannius was governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, to the city of David, which
which is called Bethlehem, because he is of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. I'm going to stop you again, because I want you to. Don't be trying to picture how many shepherds. Don't be trying to picture Mary coming into Bethlehem. Don't be trying to picture Joseph looking in the inn. Don't be trying to picture any of that stuff. Put you in it. Put you in it. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which had come to pass, which the Lord had made known to us. I mean, stop you again. I want you to be thinking, keep you in this. And you say, where is, where am I in all of this? Did you notice the shepherds were not there when she gave birth? They were not where the shepherds were when the angels came. Who is telling the story? The story that's for you. This is where you come into play. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who hear, heard it were marveled at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. And when the eight days were com completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And as is written in the law of the Lord, every man who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and, uh, and to offer sacrifice according to what it is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon them. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arm, he took him up in his arms, and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all, gen all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then <coughs> Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will also pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, and she was of great age, and she had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And so when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and began became strong in spirit, filled with the wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Father, this day I ask you to illuminate our hearts and minds, not to your word in the sense that we are trying to grab some great truth out of it, but Father, that we have your word illuminated to our hearts, that from the 
truth that's in your word, we will be stimulated this day to do what you've called us to do. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we have this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you stop and you think about this. I didn't, I didn't go into all the stuff, all the details. But what we need to understand is every one of us knows bits and pieces of this story. We know it almost all of our lives. From very small, we've seen the little plays, the kids' plays. We've seen the sheep, and we've talked about the Motel 6 in heavy rooms. You know, all that kind of stuff. We've talked about all these things almost all of our lives. And what we have oftentimes missed is the fact that when you heard Anna and Simeon, after they saw the child Jesus, after they saw the child Jesus, what did they do? They immediately went out and told everybody. And you remember the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, when he was converted, you know, the, the sign gifts were given. Remember that Jesus, or I should say God's word told us that uh, miracles, healings, and tongues would be preceding the church age to let us know it's coming into play. And they would be, but if you notice, the Apostle Paul didn't do any of those. When the Apostle Paul, because he already knew about it. The Apostle Paul, when he was converted, you know what he did? The Apostle Paul saw Jesus. And when he saw Jesus, immediately he preached. He went and told people. You know, what are we called to do? We're called to go out and preach. We're called to adorn ourselves as a church in such a way that we are presentable to the community in which we live and work. So that brings me over here. There's a Christmas tree. Too many of us get focused on the packages under the tree. Too many of us get focused on the decorating of the tree. But let's put it in a little bit of a parallel today. Let's put it in a little bit of a parallel today with what I just read in Luke chapter 2. You see, our God loves us. If you didn't know God loves you, you've been missing the boat. God loves you. Not all your circumstances are going to be great. Not all the things that take place in your life are going to be wonderful. We live a life moment by moment. Moment by moment. Event after event, you had an event today, a moment today. So what I'm going to say, Ella, is this. You went down into the water. What color do we usually associate with water? Blue. Ella, see that bulb right there? That's going to represent you today. That represents you today. The water. Because you notice... Reggie pointed out, there's only one blue ball on the whole tree. Heard Molly came to me this morning and said, there's only one blue ball. How come? <laughs> it's for today. I didn't put it there. God did. For a reason. You see, that blue ball represents the moment that Ella gave her life to Christ. And then through baptism, exposed her faith in Jesus Christ. And so that blue ball represents Ella. Ella, you know where you're at? You're on the Christmas tree that God has given to us as a church. Remember, the tree represents what? What does the tree represent? Go ahead. Don't all talk at the same time. I can't hear you. It's called an, I'll help you. It's called an evergreen. Yes, everlasting life. The tree represents everlasting life. So for the Christian, look into the concept of what God is doing. God has given us the everlasting life, salvation. Now we're talking figuratively, not physically. We're not talking about this. This is something the man does as far as this kind of tree and stuff. But the tree that God has given us is everlasting life. And everlasting life is to be adorned with moment-by-moment moment decorations of our life. So, Ella, you are on God's Christmas tree of eternity. You're there. <coughs> and so is that person and that person and that person. 
person. Each one of us is represented on God's Christmas tree of eternity. And what we need to understand is this. God didn't give us Christmas on one day. He didn't give us a Christmas on one day. If you take the word of the living God and you look at it, the plan started before the foundation of the world was laid. And then you say, well, wait a second. No, 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 but Jesus was only born on one day. Okay, let's stop. Let's back up. We read Luke chapter 1, 2. Do you know what Luke chapter 1 has in it? The birth of John the Baptist who was Jesus' cousin, and he was six months older than Jesus. It takes, well, I'll stop here for a second before I say it takes. Let me ask all you moms, all you moms, was your own experience with your child on the one day when they were delivered? <laughs> oh, yeah, most women do no. <laughs> no. It started nine months before. There's the ice cream and pickles. There's the, right, right? the cravings. There's the, uh, let's see, the expelling of stuff in your body because you're just sick all the time. That ain't even what I'm talking about. So you stop and you look. All these things took place. Your child's birth was not one day. It was the whole nine months. And not only that, but do you remember when John the Baptist, you can read Luke chapter 1, John the Baptist was in Elizabeth's womb. And Mary walked in. Do you remember what happened? Yeah. He left for joy in Elizabeth's womb. So if you really want to celebrate Christmas right, from my perspective, that's nine months for Jesus and John was six months old. <coughs> start 15 months early. You really want to celebrate Christmas right, start 15 months early. Now this year, I did notice this. Yeah. I don't see any groundhogs in there. <laughs> I'm sure. A couple years ago, the groundhog made an appearance. Is it in there? No, it's not. Okay. But you know what? That groundhog even symbolized something. And you see, we have to understand. We have to understand that God came along, and so long ago, He started the plan. He started this plan. He, he loves us so much that he started decorating his tree of eternity. Clear back in the Old Testament. Genesis 3.15, told of the coming Savior. Back many, many years ago, many, many years ago, I was sitting at Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, out in Glendale, Arizona, actually. Grand Canyon University. I'm sitting there with a couple of guys from, and they were north of South Africa, one of those little um, Mozambique, Latin, or whatever, in one of those small countries. And they had come over, and they were studying Bible theology at Grand Canyon University. So we were sitting there talking. One was about seven foot four. He was tall and thin, and he sat down there, and he said this, and he was the main talker. <coughs> he said, some missionaries came to our village. And when they came to our village, they sat down, and they started talking with us. And he says, today... I understand, but then I didn't. They started in the Old Testament. And as they started in the Old Testament, they started reading about the promise of a Savior. And as they continued on, they realized that God said the Savior was coming as a little baby. So all the way through, as they're exposing to them the Old Testament, he said, the people in my village kept saying every night, is the baby coming tonight? Is the baby coming tonight? Is the baby coming tonight? And what happened is this. He says, we were so excited. We knew there was a baby coming. Then he said this. He said, I know how Simeon felt. The guy we just read about? See, Simeon knew the Old Testament prophecies. Simeon knew exactly when a Savior would come and be born. The date given in Daniel, from the commandment to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem until the Messiah would be cut off. He knew the Messiah couldn't be cut off until the Messiah was at least age 30. These are all parts of the law that you'll find in there. So he knew he could backtrack 30 years and it was the same year that he was alive. So he said, Lord, let me see your salvation. In other words, let me see that baby. And you say, wait, Don, you just pointed at the cross. Yeah, because see, the cross didn't happen without the baby. 
The cross didn't come into being without the baby. Salvation doesn't come into play without the baby. But God started the plan so long ago because he loves you and me, cares for you and me. He wants the best for us, and he wants us to adorn ourselves accordingly. Uh, now, we're not talking about you going out and getting all nazzied up and everything else. Uh, we're not talking about you going out and do that. But I'll tell you one thing this does happen. You don't have to wear the fanciest clothes every time you go to church or every time you go anywhere. But I don't think there's a person here that doesn't at least try to comb their hair, so you guys less than others. But there's not a person here that doesn't put on something that smells good. Why do you do it? Because you stink? No. You put it on because you want other people to have a good memory of you. You know, by the way, ladies, you know smell is the most important trigger for memory. Smell is. You can catch a whiff of a certain kind of... Uh, Spice or something with cooking, and you go, oh, that was just like my mom used to do. You'll bring back that memory. It'll draw it right back in. Well, the same thing is true with us. We want to leave a good smell, a good taste in our community as the church that we talked about. So in other words, we need to adorn the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, adorn that salvation with moment-by-moment -moment events. That happened in our lives. Our little TV out in the hallway up there, it runs, no, it says there's one screen, it says, know what's happening in your church. And we put down the list of things <coughs> that are happening in our church. Why is that important? Because when somebody walks in, they can look at that. They can see that and say, wow, this church does a lot of stuff. Maybe I can be involved in such a way. Well, you know what? Luke did that just this week. He got involved in a very wonderful way. Luke went out and helped me skin and cut some deer. And boy, we, we did it. We did nine on Friday night, just the two of us. And I tell you what, we did really good. We bought an hour and 45 minutes for nine deer. We, we did good. Yeah, we were cruising. But you know what? Luke and Lindsay are relatively new to our church, but he got involved. He saw what was going on. So you know what happened? God took that moment... And he just adorned the salvation of Jesus Christ with the efforts that we put out. Lindsay was there one night, but she was more amazed at how we were cutting. So I don't know which one, but maybe this one represents, or maybe one of these represent, represents your salvation, or your commitment to work, or your commitment to do, your involvement. Things that you give. There's a song many of you remember, Thank You for Giving to the Lord by Ray Bolts. That song was really neat because he says, I dreamed I went to heaven. You were there with me. And one of the people came up to the person that he was talking about and said, Missionary came to your church and you gave. And because you gave, I am here today. Because you gave, I'm here today. Because you're involved, because you do, you adorn the church to make it look good, give a good impression to the community in which we're in, and that draws people to you. All you have to do is take this room and shut all the lights off, and you have, except for the Christmas lights, and you let some kids walk through that door. You know, those kids are going to walk through that door. They're not going to notice the piano. They're not going to notice the pastor's mic sitting up here and want to play with it. They're not going to come over and grab the hymn book. They're not going to grab this microphone. They're not even going to walk over here to this. You know where they're going to go? They're going to go right over there. And typical of every kid, what are they going to do? I'm going this way, Eric. They're going to walk right over there and say, I wonder if this was for me. <laughs> right? Oh, it's not heavy enough. I want something bigger. <laughs> Guy in early service said, come in because he saw my beard. He walks up and he says, all I want is a tree for Christmas. He said, I'm not Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> but they're going to walk up and say, I wonder what, what's in those. Now, now, now get this. This is a kid who does this with every tree, don't they? Now, what we're doing, folks, is 
We are adorning the tree of salvation. We adorn it with baptism. We adorn it with church memberships. We, I have another couple who wants to join. They've just talked to me this morning. They'll be joining next week. Wonderful. We adorn it with people getting involved. You don't realize, but you see that, that big, that big, that big ball up there that's white way up there near the blue one? That's Ken up in the top up there. And giving his service each week. See, each one of us, we adorn this. So what happens is when the people on the outside who don't know about the salvation of Christ, they don't understand about the truth of God's word. So when they come in, they go, oh, you have a gift for me? They look here. Because they're drawn from here. And they look down there and you say, yes, God has the most wonderful gift for you. The shed blood of Jesus Christ is for you to take away your sin. The plan that started before the foundation of the world was even laid. That plan is for you. And so we can present them with the underneath. But it's our lives up here. The one thing that this church, any church, the one thing we don't want is a bare tree. If the bare tree is bare, it means nobody's doing anything. There's no souls. There's no life. But when the tree is full, it signifies moment by moment, event by event. It becomes so important to us. You see, Jesus did everything according to the law. According to the law. He fulfilled everything. Did you notice how many times they mentioned? And after her days were filled, according to the law. He went to Jerusalem, according to the law, for his dedication. He was there according to the law. What people don't understand, don't realize, is that according to the law, Jesus was even born in a field. You say, hey, he was born in a manger. That was field that was bordered by a cave they used the shepherds used but a field one of only three sacrificial sheep were accepted from so legally they could only bring sacrificial sheep in the Jewish temple in the year that Jesus was born from those three fields they had massive fields one was just north of Bethlehem and the other one was up closer to Jerusalem and the other one was a little bit further away and south of Jerusalem. Only three fields were acceptable. Well, we don't see that in Scripture, but you have to go back in history to find it. But that was according to Jewish law. And the law said that the sacrificial sheep had to come from there. Jesus fulfilled not only the law of God, but Jesus fulfilled the law of the Jewish people at that time. Jesus had no excuse given to those people. He gave them no excuse at all. For them not to accept him. But they still rejected him. But he fulfilled every law. He was born in a sacrificial field. He was born according to the law, according to the commands of God, according to the Jewish law at the time. He was born the way God wanted him to. And Jesus' life was adorned with miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle and we saw it. We even see it starting with his 12th birthday. We start seeing the miraculous things that Jesus did. Jesus was adorned. We come to him and we look and we say, Jesus, what do you have for us? We're drawn down here. He gives us the gift of salvation. And when he gives us the gift of salvation, he now adorns that eternity with us. Maybe you're one of these. Maybe you're one of these. Maybe you're one of these. Maybe, maybe, you need to adorn your life more with Jesus. You know, Simeon and Anna, 
saw Jesus, and they couldn't keep their mouths shut. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen him? If you have, you're going to talk about him. Don't worry about, don't worry about all the theology that's out there and all the doctrinal truths. Just, if you see Jesus, you're going to talk about him. I mentioned God loves us so much that the plan was started so long ago. God did this. God took in the Old Testament days the expectation of the baby, like I told with these, these three men from Africa. God took the expectation of the baby and he adorned salvation with it. And they cried out, when's the baby going to be born? When's the baby going to be born? And then God took the arrival of that coming Savior and he adorned salvation more. And he gives us something to remember it by. And then God took the birth, the, the life of that baby. Eight days later, God took his trip down to Egypt. God took his life at 12, and then 30, and through 33 and a half years old, God took the life of Jesus and he adorned salvation. And he made it ready for us. And then he finished off salvation with the cross. And he said, look it, it's all because of the plan that started so long ago, that worked its way through, that you have salvation offered to you. God loves you so much. He adorned salvation. So don't make Christmas a once a year, one day a year event. It's not. It's not. You know, Black Friday. Anybody here heard of Black Friday? Okay, I just got to ask. Anybody here do Black Friday shopping? Okay, one. You know, this is the first year, I'll tell you, this is the first year that I went in a store for Black Friday that I can ever remember. We went in a Walmart store, sorry, Ken, <laughs> in Phoenix, Arizona. We walked in this Walmart store and it's taped off. And there were thousands of people in there, shoulder to shoulder. Fortunately, I went in not to buy anything, but to look at people. <laughs> Did my eyes get full? <laughs> and really, Ken, really? They do wear two pairs of pajamas sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even in Phoenix, in the heat, they were 70 degrees, you know, nice heat. But there, was, there were people in pajamas in Walmart at 11 o'clock in the morning. Buying snow sweater. <laughs> <laughs> Buying snow sweater. They bought everything, and they had these lines. And we walked through that area, and we checked it all out. And you know, to a lot of people, Black Friday started as a way to get a Christmas present for someone they loved and save themselves money to be able to afford something a little more expensive. <coughs> And now it's almost become a holiday unto itself. You look out and you watch Black Friday. These people are out there doing Black Friday <coughs> shopping. And they were out there buying Christmas presents. They were buying garden jewels. They were buying this and that. They were buying all kinds of stuff. We need to be careful. We need to adorn ourselves with the love of our Lord, with our salvation, with the truth. We need to beads and the, the blue bulb on the top of the tree sometimes. We need to be that. We need to realize that all of this was, all of this, all of this was done for us. For us. You are, you're loved, you're important, you're valuable to God. We need to let other people know that. But you can't let them know that if you aren't adorned in such a way that people be drawn to you. Say, what do you have for me? If you remember, just like a little kid, they'll come to the king first. What do you have for me? Your understanding of the greatest story ever told can be seen in how you celebrate Christmas. <clears throat> this day, I encourage you to decorate your life Decorate your life for Jesus Christ. And you know what? If your wallet opens more than your mouth, you're way behind. 
Your mouth needs to open way more to talk about Jesus than your wallet needs to open to pay for your Christmas bills. So get your mouth moving. Let people know who Jesus is. You see, without the birth, there's no cross. Without the cross, there's no payment. Without the payment, we're lost. God started a long time ago just for you. Honor him this day. Father, thank you. Thank you for the time that we're together. Thank you for this, your people. Thank you for a wonderful place to worship. Father, my prayer today is that we will talk about you more than, than we do anything else in this life. I know, Lord, we have to live. We have jobs to go to. We have family to take care of. But, Lord, none of that's possible without you in our lives. Let us realize that truth this day. Let us be the decorations, Father, on your everlasting life that you give. Lord, if there is one here that's never chosen, never asked you to be their Savior, Father, I ask this day that you touch their hearts. Let your spirit convict their very soul that they need you. And Father, before they leave this place, let them come and ask, either ask myself or another believer here, how they can choose you to be their Savior. And Father, maybe there's some that need to go further, such as Ella was, and, and be baptized. They need to declare openly, publicly, that you are the only way. And of course, Father, maybe there's others that need to go even further. And they need to declare their membership so that they become active. And, and the little things they do, Lord, tied with this church, will become ornaments on this church. Father, thank you for what you're going to do. I ask you to bless us according to your great will and way this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and as faith leads us in our song of communion. If the Lord has touched you in some way, please come, share with me.